Thank you very much. So maybe I have first to say that, um, so even though I have been in, I have a, a position in IHS and uh, I was uh, previously in uh, ENS Lyon, I didn't get the chance uh, to interact uh, a lot with Christophe, which I can only regret. But still, uh, his work, um, I think, is uh, very influential and uh, very um, inspiring to me. So I'm very uh, honored and happy to be uh, here today. Okay, so what I would like to discuss is actually, I think it's connected to spontaneous stochasticity, but I will refrain from using this terminology because um, I know that this can be, uh, actually I don't know exactly the, um, uh, the precise general definition of this notion, but uh, what I would like to discuss is how uh, noise emerges in this uh, deterministic systems, and uh, hopefully uh, this is something that we can discuss afterwards, whether it's uh, spontaneous stochasticity or not. Okay, so the, the, the system I will consider is a very, very simple uh, model for uh, a gas, okay? So you just assume that all the, uh, all the uh, elementary uh, particles are just uh, uh, spheres, and uh, the way they behave is just that they, they are transported with free transport until they collide with another uh, sphere. Okay, so they are just uh, uh, small balls. And of course, you expect that in the a gas, you have a lot of uh, small balls like this. Okay, so uh, if you would like to write uh, the equation for the system, it's actually an Hamiltonian system, which is completely uh, deterministic. And so you have a transport, which uh, is just the fact that the derivative of the position is equal to the velocity and the derivative of the velocity is equal to zero. Okay, until you have a collision. So until the distance between two centers uh, is equal to epsilon. And so if this uh, xi minus xj is equal to epsilon omega, where omega is just a unit vector, then you expect the velocity to be uh, reflected in order that you don't have any overlap. Okay, so this, this is just the exclusion condition. And if you prescribe that uh, both the momentum and the energy has to be, have to be conserved, then you get only one possible reflection, uh, which is this uh, uh, elastic scattering. So V prime I, which is the new velocity for the particle I, will be just V I minus V I minus V J dot omega times omega, and V prime J will be V J plus the same quantity. So you see that. Of course, uh, the sum V i prime plus V uh, j prime is equal to V i plus V j. And you can also uh, check that if you look at the sum of the square, it's also conserved, okay? So of course, there is um, uh, still some configuration for which this dynamics will not be really uh, defined. Of course, you see that if at some point you, you have three particles colliding at the same time, then, then uh, you have kind of issue to define uh, the, the next configuration. But this can be proved to happen only for a, a zero uh, measure set of initial configurations, so we will not uh, be really uh, um, uh, have any trouble with this. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the beginning, and you see that here everything is deterministic and well posed for uh, all times. Okay, so now let me uh, uh, try to um, uh, explain why I, I, I would expect this system to behave a little bit like a spontaneous stochastic system. So the point is that you see that uh, in a gas, the size of the particles will be very small because you have a lot of particles and you would like all these particles to be, say, contained in a volume of size one. Okay, and then you see that if you shift a little bit uh, one particle, then in some uh, cases you will, you will have a collision. So that's typically uh, what you have on the, the right uh, picture here. But if you just shift of a distance, which is of the same order as the size of the particle, then maybe you will not have a collision or a collision with a different deflection angle. Okay, because the deflection angle is really uh, depending on this impact parameter at the collision. So if you just change a little bit the impact parameter, then uh, you see that uh, uh, everything will be changed. And so, the dynamics after this collision will be different and then everything will be different forever. Okay, so this, this uh, say, in maybe more mathematical term is to say that essentially you have a Lipschitz constant for these trajectories with a modulus which is like one over epsilon. Each time you have a collision, then you see that uh, the, the, say, it's not really unstable in the sense that, of course, for fixed epsilon, everything is Lipschitz, 
but the Lipschitz constant will diverge very fast when epsilon goes to zero, okay? And so in particular, you don't expect to have any deterministic uh, limit for the trajectories of this particle. So you see that, uh, imagine that you have even just one particle which is moving and all the other are just obstacles of size epsilon, which is the, the, uh, what happened for the Lorentz gas. Okay, so you fixed uh, somehow your uh, obstacles on, a, on, a, on, say, with uh, just fixed bar, uh, bar, uh, positions, or at least with fixed average position, and then you just move a little bit all these obstacles around their, their average position, and then you see that you have very different trajectories, okay? Because, say, maybe the first collision will be different, and then all the, the, the sequel of the, will be different. Okay, so then in this, because of this very strong instability at the microscopic level, of course, you see that in the limit, epsilon goes to zero, the, yeah, all this, this uh, very small shift, you, you will not see them, but then you, you don't expect to have a deterministic limit for this trajectory. Okay, so then the, uh, the idea is that you still uh, uh, will be able to, to prove a kind of convergence if you accept at some point to uh, put a little bit of noise. So here, it's not clear that it's a little bit of noise because I will consider uh, somehow um, uh, a distribution over the, the space of, uh, of all possible configurations. But then I, I will try to discuss that actually in this, in this initial noise, there are different scales, and that somehow uh, only the small scales are responsible for the, for the noise which will emerge. Okay, so here what I assume for, to, to start with is that I know essentially only uh, uh, the, the distribution, the, the density of particles in the phase space, in the one particle phase space, which is this uh, F naught. And then since I don't know exactly the, the exact distribution, the exact correlation between all the particles, I start by assuming that they are almost independent. Of course, they are not completely independent because they, uh, they, they cannot uh, uh, overlap. Okay, and so here I assume that both the number of particles and their um, initial configurations are random variables. So this, this n is just distributed essentially according to Poisson process. That's, that's why I, I have this mu epsilon to the n divided by factorial n. So mu epsilon is the typical number of particles. Then I assume that each one of these particles is essentially distributed according to this F naught. And since they are, say, essentially independent, then this is just a tensor product. And then I add this condition that they uh, uh, should not overlap, and then I just normalize this by this partition function z epsilon. Okay, so that's the grand canonical formalism for this uh, system of particles. Okay, and so uh, what I would like really to, uh, to uh, explain in the, in the rest of this talk is that actually this is a very uh, multi-scale problem. Actually, there are, there are, there are essentially uh, an infinite number of scales in this problem, and that essentially all the small scales will disappear when I take the limits as epsilon goes to zero, but still it will uh, somehow remain a very uh, strong footprint of this uh, multi-scale structure because we will see uh, uh, the apparition of this uh, dynamical noise. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. And actually I, I will um, um, say, um, look at three different approaches to uh, look at this randomness, okay? So one is very classical, it actually follows the approach by Landford. This, is, this would be the first one. Then I, I will try to look at the uh, trajectories and what, what the limits of these trajectories, how it can be defined. And then in the last part, I will try to look at the fluctuation and dissipation. Okay, so uh, the first uh, way you can see this, this randomness, which appears somehow in the limit, it's just by looking at the, the limits of the empirical measure. Okay, so say what you should have in mind is this picture here, that if you look at one particle in this gas, what you will see, okay, is that it has a motion, which is just a, a piecewise straight motion. So you have uh, transport, then the collision, you are deflected, and then you have another straight line and so on. Okay, so the typical trajectory of a particle is like this. But what is important is that, say, in the, in the original system, of course, all these deflections are completely deterministic. They depend on the positions and velocities of the other particles. 
while in the limit, if you are just interested in looking at just one particle, one typical particle, then all this deflection will uh, become uh, stochastic in the sense that both the time for the collision and the deflection angle will be uh, random parameters. Okay, so that's what is described by the Boltzmann equation. And so the, the theorem, which has been proved uh, quite a long time ago by Boltzmann, by uh, Lanford, is that if you look at so a very actually uh, uh, a special limit that uh, maybe I, I should comment a little bit. So um, you are in a gas, so the number of particles is very large. Their size, of course, has to be very small. I, I also, you have a packing problem, which is not at all what I would like to consider here. And then uh, you have this uh, scaling condition, which actually relates the number of particles, average number of particles on their side, which is this condition that mu epsilon times epsilon to d minus one has to be of the order of one. And this, this is just to have that somehow the two phenomena, uh, so the transport and collisions, are approximately of the same order. Okay, so uh, this can be seen just by, this is actually a, a computation that, that I think was done by uh, by Maxwell, that uh, if you put all, all these, all the, your particle, all your obstacles on a lattice with size uh, epsilon, then you see that the probability for, say, just one moving particle to have a collision in a time one uh, is of the order of one if you have this scaling here. Okay, so that's essentially uh, how you see all the uh, all the obstacles from from the moving particle. Okay, so the the um, cross section. The way you see each, each particle is just epsilon to d minus one, and of course you have new epsilon of them, so you see something like this. Okay, and so now if you look at this limit and you uh, define uh, this object, which is the empirical measure, which is defined here, so it's just a, a measure, which is uh, the sum of uh, Dirac masses at every point, every, uh, say, every, um, so a point here, a z, is just the position and the velocity of the particle i. Okay, so zi is both xi and vi. So you are in the phase space, you put a direct mass each time you, you have a particle, and then you uh, just, just look at the average of this. So one over mu epsilon times the sum of these uh, direct masses. So when you test on the function h, you get exactly this sum here. So if you look at this measure, then in the Boltzmann grad limit, it will concentrate on the solution to the Boltzmann equation. So this, this, this equation is not very, um, uh, uh, very nice, at least from a mathematical point of view, it's really uh, like a monster, but uh, I will not really uh, enter into the te technical details, so it will not be so complicated. So here you see that you have two parts in this equation. The first part here is just uh, the transport. You see that if you uh, just take the right-hand side to be zero, then you see that uh, you have that F is constant along the characteristics, so on the line X, x plus vt and v constant. Okay, so that's exactly the transport. And then you have this, uh, this uh, operator here, which is quadratic. So a first important thing is that, say, t and x in this operator are just parameters, okay? They, they are not really important, and this, this just expresses the fact that collisions are pointwise, both in time and, 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 and space. So you see that in the limit, when the particles of size zero, then they can see each other only if they are exactly the same point. And now you see that uh, this this actually um, uh, express a kind of jump process in the velocity space. So you see that you will have more particle of velocity v if at some point you have both particle of velocity v prime and a particle of velocity v prime uh, star, and they collide, and then maybe uh, after this collision, one particle will have a uh, velocity v. Okay, so this, this is what is called a gain term. And then you have here a loss term, which tells you that maybe you will lose, lose some particle of velocity v just because they will collide with other particles, with other velocities, and then switch to another velocity. So this is really like, this is really a, a jump process, a random jump process. And you see that what is important and wh where you see randomness here is that this omega, which is now the, uh, so still the, uh, the uh, deflection parameter is now a random uh, parameter. You integrate over all possible omega here, and actually this is a differential form, but you see that you will also integrate over all possible time, so both the time of collision and the deflection angle in this equation are random. Okay? So, um, 
unfortunately, this theorem is only uh, valid for a short time, but, uh, but at least it tells you that uh, you, you see something which uh, start to be uh, stochastic. So of course you can, uh, maybe I, I should say, uh, I will not enter into the details of the different proofs, but maybe I can say just a, a few words to, um, to, to explain, say, to make an intuition of how uh, this uh, stochasticity appears. So the way you, 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 you essentially prove this result is that both for the Boltzmann equation and for the real, traje the real trajectories, what you uh, do is that you, uh, look at all possible trajectories of a particle. So you say, okay, what is the probability of having a particle with position x and velocity v at time t? And then you look at just uh, backwards of, uh, to the history of this particle and you say, okay, if, if this position has at, at, at this position and velocity, then if I go backward, uh, I can just uh, transport it backwards until it has a collision and so on. And so you just go back to uh, initial time and at initial time you know everything just because the probability uh, density at time zero is, is uh, perfectly known. Okay, so you do that for, for uh, uh, the real trajectory and you also do that for the uh, limiting equation for the Boltzmann equation and then you prove that essentially you have the same uh, set of trajectories okay and but you see that it's a superposition of a lot of different trajectories and that's really important so the way you write uh, uh, the proof of this Boltzmann equation is really that you understand the, this equation as, as a superposition of a lot of different trajectories, and then you try to, to weight each of these trajectories depending on the initial data. Okay, but, but what is really important is this coupling between the two types of trajectories, and then you see that you have only a very small shift, but, but you have exactly the same deflection. So in the end, if provided that you can, uh, but that you have enough regularity on the initial data, then, then, then you can prove this, this, um, this thing, okay? So, the uh, important, so the, so the technical part of the proof is to, uh, is, is to show that you don't have what is called recollisions, in the, which actually hold in the, the, the true dynamics, but this happens with, with a very uh, low, a very uh, a small probability, so you just don't care. Okay, but this is the technical part, this is the geometric part of the, 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 of the proof that you can do this coupling up to these three collisions that uh, are essentially negligible in the undeniable. Okay, so I just would like to comment a little bit on this, this, uh, this uh, regularity assumption. So you have this coupling, you, say, you see that for each one of these trajectories, uh, up to a very small spatial shift, you get exactly uh, uh, the same trajectories, okay? And so you see that what is really important is that uh, when you are back to time zero, when you just uh, uh, move a little bit of a particle of a distance of the order of epsilon, you have the same probability, okay? So what is really important here is that you don't have this kind of microstructures, so you, you don't, don't have a, a dependence of say the, the, the probability will not change on this distance of the order of epsilon. Okay, so that's what is really important is proved by Lanford. And of course, you, you, you don't expect that this will be true uh, beyond Lanford's time or, or, or uh, maybe uh, twice or five times Lanford's time. So then if you would like to really go beyond this time, then you, you need to understand why this, this say how this mixing is uh, somehow regenerated. Okay, so that's uh, probably a very uh, challenging question. Of course, I have, I have no idea on how to do that, but say what I would like to uh, um, insist on is the fact that uh, if, if, if you have this limit, it's really because, because you can write the Boltzmann equation as a superposition of, of trajectories, which actually uh, uh, become random in the limit. Okay, so now I would like to come back to these trajectories and, and try to explain that uh, you can really uh, uh, look at uh, stochastic Lagrangian trajectories for, the, for your particles and maybe this, this is uh, closer to uh, uh, what people do in, uh, in spontaneous stochasticity. So I would like actually to, to, to prove a statement which is just uh, 
you know, uh, just, just correspond to this picture that I show you at the beginning of the previous part, which is this one. Okay. So I would like to prove that actually I have a superposition of trajectories like this, okay, which are random. Okay, so if I would like to do something like this, I have to do uh, two different things compared to Lanford proof. The first thing is that I would like to tag one particle and really follow the trajectory of this particle. So that's not really difficult. So there is mathematical uh, art trick to do that, that you uh, uh, now say that you know the position and, and exactly the position and, and velocity of this uh, first particle just by letting this uh, this this rho epsilon goes to uh, the Dirac mass, okay? So that's uh, the way I tag, so I specify one particle, and now I would like to, to track its trajectory and not only a density of something. So I would like to, to know all the time correlations of, of this thing, just to, to have the, the, the whole trajectory. And then, and then it's the way you can do that is just by uh, looking at an expectation with different uh, times here, Okay, so this is kind of dual form to just track the trajectories. I have a lot of, of times, and then at each time I have a function h1 that you can imagine to be just an indicator function that your particle will be uh, in a small domain. Okay, so I would like to understand the, the, the limit of this guy. Okay, and actually all the methods that, that are, so if you follow the, tra the strategy by Lanford, you can do that, it's not really a problem. And then what you can prove is that uh, uh, in the same limit, so uh, with this uh, uh, Boltzmann grad scaling here that mu epsilon times epsilon to d minus one has to be one, you can look at the trajectory of this first particle, okay? And uh, it will converge toward the sto uh, stochastic process, okay? And this, so this is a simple uh, stochastic project, uh, uh, process, so just the uh, derivative of the position is still the velocity, it's this, this part is the transport, it's, it's not changed. And now V1 has random jumps, so now it's really random. And you have uh, the transition rate here, which is this uh, complicated thing. So F is now the, so is the solution of uh, the Boltzmann equation. So of course the, 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 the probability of having a jump is much, uh, um, uh, much uh, bigger if you have a lot of particles than if you have no, no particle. So it's, it's proportional to this uh, density of particles. Okay, and then uh, you have this, uh, this, this cross-section that I didn't really discuss, but which, which was already uh, in the Boltzmann equation, uh, which tells you that, uh, um, so which is really uh, specific to our spheres. If you change the microscopic interaction, probably you can uh, redo uh, a lot of things, provided that this microscopic interaction is compactly supported, but uh, then you will change only this cross-section here, okay? And of course, uh, the time for which you can do, if, if you imagine that essentially this is the same proof as, as Lanford, then of course the, uh, the time for which you can do the, this thing is exactly Lanford time, okay? So maybe I would like to uh, uh, make small comments about this, this, um, this result here. So the first one is that, uh, uh, as I said, you can prove this, this, uh, this result just by looking at Lanford uh, proof, it's just using the same strategy, and then uh, uh, just um, um, uh, trying to connect uh, what is the real trajectory of the particle, and uh, this, so the trajectories which come from the BBGKY hierarchy, so which has a bit uh, slightly different, but really uh, this, this uh, by duality, so using this test function h1, h2, hn, then you can really uh, track a trajectory and then, and then say uh, you can even track the whole trajectory by uh, taking limits and, and looking at uh, function in the scored space. Okay, so that's just technical, but essentially you can uh, do everything just using the same arguments. Okay, but then you can also use uh, an alternative method. So you will not prove something which is much better, but maybe you can understand a bit better. Okay, so uh, another way to do that is to, uh, just to forget about the BBGI uh, hierarchy, and then you look at the real clusters of, of particles. Okay, so the way you do that is that you start from your initial configuration, then you, you look at uh, and you define the dynamical clusters to be all the particles which are 
related by a, connect, by, by a, a collision at some point on your interval 0t. Okay, so you fix your, your interval, okay, and then you look, at, uh, you, you look at all your particles. This is just like uh, a vertices of a graph, and then you put an edge between two particles provided they, 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 they have a collision, and then you look at all uh, connected components of the graph, and this, these are the dynamical clusters. Okay, so this means that particle one and three will be in the same cluster if they all both meet particle number two, even though they, they, they don't meet each other. Okay, so they are just a connected component of the graph. Okay, so this, this is something that you can define. And actually, what you can prove, and, and that's uh, essentially just a small computation, is that uh, you can uh, do a kind of cluster expansion for this, this, uh, this, uh, dynamics, this the dynamics, exactly as, as you do a, a cluster expansion at equilibrium, okay? So now you can consider really your gas as a gas of clusters instead of a gas of particles. You can really consider your gas as a gas of clusters. And then you see that uh, uh, it's enough to look at uh, just one cluster to, to, to understand the dynamics of a particle, okay? And so if you do that, it's, it's, uh, what is nice is that you really understand how the particle uh, connect in each cluster, and you really see that uh, somehow uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the reason uh, why you have this deflection, you really uh, see everything uh, uh, very well. And you see in particular that uh, this clustering condition, which is just a collision condition, can be uh, written uh, uh, in a very simple way, provided that you introduce this chain of variables. So, at, so you, you look at uh, the graph, so from, from your graph, of collision, you extract a minimal graph, okay? So this, this will be really important. And then you introduce a change of variable, and you say that two particles which will collide, you just look at their uh, relative position, okay? And their relative position, you will just decompose using the fact that they have a collision. And so the, the relative position here, plus a time times the relative velocity will be just equal to uh, epsilon omega, which omega is the, 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 the impact parameter. Okay, and then you see that you can introduce this change of variable. Of course, this is a, a bijective, it's bijective, and you can compute the, uh, the, the Jacobian. And you see that the Jacobian, uh, in the Jacobian, you, you get this prefactor one over mu epsilon. Okay, and so you really see the connection somehow uh, between the fact that you have this instability, so that the fact that here you have this epsilon, which is a different scale, and the fact that in the, in, in the limit, uh, it will be uh, random. Okay, so I, th I think this, this, this is another way to, to write things, but maybe it's easier to understand what really happens with real trajectories, okay? Because say, in the BBGKY approach, you have kind of trajectories, but they are not real trajectories. Okay, and then there is uh, the, the, the last point that I, I would like to discuss. I don't know how much time I have, I, I don't know. Okay, perfect. Okay, so that's the, the, the last way, the, the last thing that I would like to discuss, and actually it's uh, also related to uh, uh, fluctuations and dissipation, say, uh, from a dynamical point of view. And so it's a bit more subtle to see the connection, I think, with, with this uh, spontaneous stochasticity, but still I think it's, it's always present because it's always the same story, actually, okay? So now what I would like to, to, the way I would like to see the emergence of noise in this, uh, in this, uh, in this problem is to look at uh, uh, the fluctuation field. So the fluctuation field has been uh, defined uh, in the previous uh, lecture by Fabio. So you look at the, so now my, my, my variable, my, my random variable is this, this empirical measure. So I look at the empirical measure, I subtract the expectation of this empirical measure, which, uh, convert actually to the Boltzmann uh, solution of the Boltzmann equation. And then I, I rescale by square root of nu epsilon because this is just uh, the usual uh, scaling for the central limit theorem. Okay, so that's the fluctuation field. And now I would like to understand how this, this fluctuation uh, field behaves in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And so what I say is that in this case, it's a bit more intricate because somehow there, you, you, so you will have a, an initial fluctuation, of course, you see that if you start even from this uh, uh, factorized structure, then, then you can compute the limit of this, this, uh, of this uh, uh, fluctuation field, and it's, uh, you still have something. 
But so what I say is that actually the, the initial fluctuation actually can be decomposed in two different uh, um, components. So one is the fluctuation at scale one, and this will be encoded in the, uh, in the limit uh, uh, in this uh, zeta naught, which is just the, the, the limit of the zeta epsilon naught, okay, so at time zero. So uh, the, the naught here is just time zero. So if you look at this uh, fluctuation field at time zero, you look at the limit when epsilon goes to zero, you get a limit, and so you see, see that you still have a bit of stochasticity here in the initial data, okay? But this is really what you see at scale uh, one. So you see that epsilon goes to zero, so all the other scales that just disappear, okay? But actually, they, they will not exactly disappear because you have another uh, noise, okay? So here now you have an initial noise, but you will have another one, which is a dynamical noise, and this, this noise will, uh, uh, if, if you are at equilibrium, actually it will exactly balance the dissipation uh, coming from the Boltzmann equation. So I think it's, it's really important to see that, of course, here you still have uh, stochasticity uh, at scale one in the, uh, in the, in the the initial data, and of course this one is not spontaneously stochastic. This is just because you have stochasticity at the beginning and so you end up with stochastic and nothing is really surprising here. But the, the other thing is that because of this very small fluctuation at scale epsilon, epsilon square, epsilon to the three and so on, so because of this very small fluctuation, which are really, uh, say, uh, a noise which is vanishing in the limit when epsilon goes to zero, then you have another contribution, which is the dy dynamical noise, and this dynamical noise somehow is, is more uh, uh, spontaneous. So what you can prove is this, uh, so at equilibrium, actually, you can prove something like this for short time, so for times of the order of, uh, of uh, Lanford time, uh, if you start from any uh, initial factorized initial data. But now if I, I'm, I'm looking at the specific case where this initial data is the Gibbs measure, so F0 is just a Maxwellian, okay, so you get an invariant measure for, for your dynamics. Okay, and now you look at the, always the same limits, um, so uh, with this uh, scaling relation here. I assume that at time zero, I have the Gibbs measure, so of course this Gibbs measure is invariant, so if I just look at the, uh, the say, the equivalent of Landford theorem, it's not very interesting because this just tells you that since the measure is invariant, then you converge to Maxwellian, and the Maxwellian is just a stationary solution of the Boltzmann equation, so essentially you prove that zero is equal to zero, which is not really interesting, but, but in this case, what is interesting is to look at the next order correction, and this next order correction is given by the, um, by the fluctuation field. And so what you can prove is that this, this fluctuation field converges to a stochastic process. So now, of course, the stochastic process is more complicated because it lives somehow in an infinite dimensional space, contrary to uh, the, the Lagrangian trajectories, which are finite dimensional. So now this uh, uh, zeta t will be a, a solution of a, a stochastic PDE, as in the previous lecture. So you see that you have two, um, two terms in this stochastic PDE. So the first part is just a deterministic part. So L is the linearized Boltzmann operator. So it consists of two parts. So you have minus V grad X, which is the transport part. And then uh, you have uh, a collision part, which is, so maybe I should uh, come back. Okay, it's not really. Uh, oh, oh, it was here. So if you take this, uh, this, this uh, collision operator and then you linearize it around the Maxwellian, okay, then you get an operator which is linearized. Okay, so it would be uh, M of V prime times uh, F of V prime star plus uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you linearize everything here. And so you get the linearized operator will be both uh, the transport here and the linearized part of this one. Okay, so this, this is the, the deterministic part uh, in, the, uh, in the stochastic PDE. And then you have a noise part here. So eta is a Gaussian noise, which is delta correlated in T and X. Okay, so it's really uh, like, like, like the collision operator. The collision operator is localized in T and X, so now everything is uh, delta correlated in T and X. And then you have a covariance, which is a bit complicated to write, and I, I don't want to write it here, but there is a very um, intuitive way you can get this covariance. It's just to say that uh, uh, of course, you 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 are you start with the uh, invariant measure, so 
you have a stationary solution of this, and then if you uh, somehow balance the dissipation coming from this linearized operator here and the noise here, then you uh, you get the covariance. Okay, so it's not very complicated, but it's just like an integral operator. It's so, okay. It's not very uh, funny to write. Okay, and the, 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 the nice thing with this uh, theorem is that uh, this convergence actually holds for all kinetic time, so we can take T as large as you want, can even take uh, T uh, to be slowly, slowly diverging, so it can go to infinity when epsilon goes to uh, zero, and um, so of course this is better because you can say, uh, prove that this equation holds for all times. Okay, so um, I think I'm uh, uh, almost done. I would like just to comment. I will not uh, explain how to do that, but essentially it's really uh, based on the same uh, cluster expansions. Okay, so it's really, um, uh, so you can do cluster expansion either starting from the BGQY hierarchy or starting from this real uh, uh, dynamical clusters. And then with these cluster techniques, which are developed, say, originally at equilibrium, you can do exactly the same from the dynamical point of view, just by looking at, so it's just a different uh, way to connect particles because they just have a collision. They are not just overlapping, but else it's almost the same, okay? So I, I just would like to, to um, finish with a couple of remarks. So the first one is that um, <coughs> this dynamical noise, eta, you see that it's not something that is really stochastic. Uh, it's, it's, it's not um, um, a randomness, which is at, at the scale one in the, uh, in the initial data. The scale one of the uh, uh, randomness is already encoded in the zeta zero, okay? So now this dynamical noise comes from somewhere else, and it comes from this very small structure uh, at the different scales, so epsilon and all, uh, uh, say, all uh, orders in epsilon. So that's really more uh, like uh, something which is uh, spontaneously stochastic, okay? Then uh, an another way to, to rephrase the same thing is that if you look at the same uh, kind of, um, uh, say, of setting, but instead of looking at the boltzmann grad limit, you're, you just look at a mean field limit. So mean field limit is different because instead of having uh, uh, just interaction between particles which are close to each other, you, you see uh, interaction with all uh, particles, but each, the strength of each interaction is very small. Okay, so it's different way of, of uh, say, a different uh, scaling limit for a system of particles. And so now if you look at this uh, mean field limit, so of course, even at the, the, the level of the law of large number, it's very different because you get a Vladov equation, which has no irreversibility and no nothing like, no, no randomness in it, okay? So it's just like a transport equation. But if you look at this fluctuation field, you will see that you have the fluctuation field is, so you have still a stochasticity at time, at time zero for the same reason, which is the scale one. But then you, you, you have just a transport of this, of this uh, um, uh, fluctuation field, you don't have this dynamical noise. So this dynamical noise is really uh, specific to this, uh, to this uh, uh, low density limit or boltzmann grand limit, and it's really related to the fact that uh, this fluctuation uh, compensates exactly the dissipation. Of course, it, if the, uh, the Vladov equation is not dissipative, so there is no fluctuation to compensate the dissipation. Okay, and then uh, uh, just a, a, a last remark is that, uh, as I told you, this, at equilibrium, you can justify this convergence of the fluctuation field uh, for very long times, even uh, slowly diverging with uh, epsilon. Then uh, you, you see that you can look at the uh, fast relaxation limit of this equation. Actually, you can do both limits at the same time. And then what you prove is that uh, you, you get in, what you get in the end is the fluctuating hydrodynamics. Okay, of course, it's, everything is linear because you are close to equilibrium. But this is actually a, a, a way that you uh, can derive fluctuating hydrodynamics starting from the deterministic system of particles. So, it, and you see that the noise in this fluctuating hydrodynamics is really coming from all these very small instabilities. And, and that's it. I will stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you a lot, Laura. So, 
Uh, what always troubled me is the three collisions that you mentioned. Uh, it's uh, if I try to compute it or do corrections to Boltzmann equations, they necessarily infrared divergent from starting from some order depending on dimensionality. Uh, it's all nice in equilibrium, all the divergences cancel. Uh, but it, when it's you are not in equilibrium, then they, they are there, like this Dorfman Cohen uh, anomalies or memory effect or whatever. Which means that everything is nice in equilibrium, but then this equation is irrelevant in equilibrium. It's supposed to describe non equilibrium situations, right? And I don't see how it can do it according to this type of argument. Uh, I'm not sure to understand your question. So, what I say is that you can derive this fluctuating equation even out of equilibrium, but for very small times. Then I would expect it to be, I think it's uh, uh, technical, so and technical is a, bit, uh, is a bit wrong, and I will try to explain. I would expect uh, the equation to be uh, still valid for kinetic times and for slowly diverging time. Of course, if you wait for a very, very long time, then, then probably uh, you will see the recollisions and this kind of thing. At any time, non-zero, uh, if you compute a correction to Boltzmann equation of sufficiently high order, just expanding in density, you'll have infrared divergence, which yeah, means the size of your box then, uh, in some positive power, which could, you know, compensate for whatever small time you have. That's called Dorfman Cohen anomalies. They are known for 50 years, right? And some situation in equilibrium, they all cancel. Just all cancel. They, they aren't there. In non-equilibrium, they are there, right? So, which means that there are, even in Lorentz gas, just, you know, you just compute. Okay. This, is this is called memory effect. Okay. Yeah, but I think it's, I, I don't compute any correction to the Boltzmann equation. I, I'm just looking at the fluctuation field, and I think it's not a correction. It's not a correction to the law of large numbers. It's another way to, to it, it's, of course, it's it's uh, a quantity which, which, uh, uh, some, somehow, where somehow you need uh, to be able to see structure at, say, higher order in epsilon, but it's not a correction to the mean field, to the, to the law of large numbers. It's not like looking at the Boltzmann equation and computing, uh, say, not next order terms in epsilon. In, in, in this, this next order term, I agree that uh, you would see a recollision. But what I say is that recollision, somehow it's, uh, say, say the, the, the stochastic structure of this uh, limit is 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 much more robust than just it's it's not equivalent to look at uh, the next order correction in the Boltzmann equation and actually you can even uh, derive large deviation for this. Uh, Oh, this is a theorem. <laughs> <laughs> this is a theorem. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, can I, I, I want a question which might be related in your theorem. I mean, you, you have this equilibrium assumption. So what uh, prevents you to, to, to get the same theorem taking a uh, distribution of initial condition, which is not an equilibrium one? So uh, what I say is that I can prove uh, an, an analogous theorem outside from equilibrium, so starting from the same initial data, but the, uh, the difference will be that uh, I get it only for uh, Lanford time. But I get the same theorem that, uh, so of course the linearized uh, operator is more complicated because, uh, because uh, you have to linearize around this F0, so this uh, F which is a solution of the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so it's more complicated. And then uh, the noise is also more complicated and so it's really more complicated because even from a mathematical point of view, then you get an operator which is not self-adjoint. You get a, 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 a noise which is more complicated. So, but you can derive this equation for short time, even starting from the non-equilibrium situation. And so, can you derive also the large deviation result here for short time? When yes. You, yeah. Yes. Okay. Could, I just had a quick question. Actually, it's very interesting work. Um, your stochastic process that you get in the limit for the particles. 
I mentioned in my talk this uh, representation of Navia Stokes by Constantine Ear. Uh, this is very reminiscent. Can you, do you get a stochastic representation of the solution of the Boltzmann equation from the stochastic process? So it's, it's very similar in the sense that in the Constantine Ear representation, the stochastic process makes reference to the velocity field that satisfies the Navier-Stokes equation. So your stochastic process makes reference to the distribution function satisfying Boltzmann equation. So that it seems like there should be some nonlinear, you know, some representation nonlinear in the sense of McKean that that then characterizes the Boltzmann equation. Have you thought about this? Uh, so. Um... Actually, I think it, it was, uh, uh, I think it's a problem that uh, many po people uh, uh, more or less studied or, but uh, say the problem is, so maybe I can say like this. So if, if you already know that you can solve the Boltzmann equation and mm -hmm. you have a nice solution of it, so a smooth solution of it, mm -hmm. then you can define this, this uh, jump process for the, to, to get this uh, stochastic Lagrangian trajectories. Mm -hmm. The point is that it's not completely clear um, uh, uh, to prove at the same time, so so forget about the Boltzmann equation and, and directly uh, uh, prove that uh, uh, you have a, a process which is uh, defined so with a a, 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 a jump uh, low which depends on on f itself. So doing that. the both things at the same time is not mm -hmm. completely uh, uh, trivial. So so if you start by solving the Boltzmann equation, proving that you have a nice solution. Then you can uh, define this this uh, Lagrangian uh, trajectories. Mm -hmm. Of course, formally everything is equivalent, mm -hmm. but uh, then from the mathematical point of view, uh, there is an issue here uh, because it's not clear how to define this uh, this process if f is a non-smooth solution of the Boltzmann equation. Sure, so like if you're looking at De Perna Leon's solution of yeah. Boltzmann, yeah. you would have no idea. I mean, it's similar actually for the Navier-Stokes case because Constantine Ear only proved it for smooth solutions. For Dune, Reza Kanlu has generalized this to some weak solutions of Navier-Stokes. But I mean, there's actually interesting questions then about if you look at the uh, hydrodynamic limit like uh, Bardos and Goltz and Lebermore did, uh, and you start with this stochastic representation, do you recover the Constantine ear representation from this stochastic one? You might. This I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So, anyways. Uh, is there any more question? So thanks a lot, Lord. Thank you.